It's the bird emergency where we talk about critically endangered birds, threatened birds, vulnerable birds, and the people who go to great lengths to do their best to make sure that they hang. I'm Grant Williams. I'm your host. I'm only a pretend scientist. As I've said before, I did horticulture once. But today we're talking to the Research and Conservation Director of the Philippines Eagle Foundation, Mr. Jason Ibanez. Did I get that right, Jason? Yeah, yeah, perfect. <laughs> Hello, good day, and uh, thanks for inviting me over. That's a pleasure, and and I I now know after speaking to you for a few minutes why you got the good day so right, because you did a a good part of your was it your doctoral your doctoral work or your master's yeah, work in Darwin? That's right. It's a doctorate, PhD in uh, natural resource management. Yeah. Let's go there first before we talk about the origins of the foundation and why it's necessary. How did you end up studying in Australia and what was your your research focused on here? Yeah, so I'm a biologist by training. I took my bachelor's and master's in biology here in the Philippines. And then after doing work for over a decade with the eagles, you know, I thought, you know, I think it's also important that I study the social science side of uh, conservation work. So there was this uh, opportunity. There's this scholarship offered by the Australian government. It's called uh, Australian Leadership Award. And you know, I was looking at the program and the support, and I, I liked it. So I, I applied for, for this scholarship. And this was all part of the plan, really, to put more people aspect into the uh, conservation uh, work that we do. And I was very much interested on indigenous people's engagement in uh, conservation. If I may share, more than 70% of the remaining uh, forest habitats in the Philippines are basically within the ancestral lands or ancestral domains, as they are called in the the Philippines, of uh, indigenous peoples. And after doing nest surveys, after doing research, we always work and get in touch with indigenous people. So I thought, you know, maybe a, a, a PhD on natural resource management with indigenous peoples would be very useful for a program. And so I was very successful. I applied for that uh, scholarship and I chose Charles Darwin University in uh, Darwin Northern Territory. I, I can say that's perhaps the um, center of Aboriginal territories in, in Australia. And so I did my four-year PhD program. Three years of, of it is in Darwin, doing the coursework, doing the thesis, and of course, also visiting some of the Aboriginal lands and looking at how the Australian government is doing conservation work with the um, traditional owners of Aboriginal land. I focused on integration or merge scientific knowledge with uh, indigenous knowledge. That's my uh, thesis topic. So I, it's basically about how best do we uh, work with indigenous peoples and then do fair conservation projects with them and then them benefiting mostly from this uh, conservation work. And yeah, I uh, graduated in 2015. And that began what uh, we have been calling in our program in the foundation as our culture-based conservation program, which is basically a meaningful and fair conservation partnership that brings tangible conservation results for Philippine eagles, but also improves the lives of uh, indigenous peoples. And I'm really very fortunate and happy to have done that PhD program in Australia. That must have been a really interesting time to be doing that kind of program in Australia because it's really quite new that it's in the mainstream that the traditional owners here are involved in programs like that. And I've got a couple of episodes coming up, Jason, um, one on the golden-shouldered parrot where some pastoralists have been working very closely with the traditional owners in Cape York in far north Queensland to try and preserve what's left of one of the populations of that parrot, which is really rare and has had a whole lot of trapping as a as a pressure 
on the population as well as habitat clearing. But going back to Indigenous burning practices has been a key there. And then on the other side of the country, but still in the tropical north, we've got the Gordian Finch has been working on a program with Worldwide Fund for Nature, WWF. So it's really great that's being integrated here. And I'm really pleased that our government in Australia has helped you take a really important segment of the conservation work back to the Philippines. Now, I'll do a spoiler here because not only has the Philippines Eagle Foundation been really, really successful in integrating community with conservation, another one of your foundations in the Philippines, the Katara Foundation, has used a very a similar model and had really great success in recent times as well. So looks like the way of the future. So tell us about the Philippines Eagle. Most people my age are probably aware of it as the monkey eating eagle. That's how it used to be in books when I was when I was young. But it's an iconic bird in the Philippines. So tell us about how important the Philippines eagle is to the Philippines nation. The Philippine eagle is, of course, one of the largest raptors in the world. And it is also found only in the Philippines. No? And I think it's just, it makes perfect sense that for a national symbol, a bird no? that's unique only to a country would fit, or would fit that uh, distinction. The Philippine eagle was declared as a national bird in 1995. But unfortunately, although being uh, declared uh, as a national bird, our national symbol is still IUC and critically endangered, primarily because it's very much forest dependent. It couldn't live outside of the forest. And unfortunately, majority of the original you know, pre-colonial forest cover of the Philippines is gone. According to projections, more than 90% of the Philippine archipelago, so that's 300,000 uh, square kilometers, you know, more than 90% was practically covered with ancient forests before uh, Europeans came to the Philippines. But now that's only down to less than 20%. And what's really uh, sad about the Philippine Eagle is that it's only found in four uh, major islands of the country. You know? So we've, uh, we have the title of having uh, a lot of islands, you know, 7, 000, over 7,000 islands, but the Philippine eagle is found only on four of its largest islands, and that's namely Luzon, Leyte, Samar, and now. And we think that more than 50% of the 400 pairs that's left, now we think that there are no more than 400 Philippine eagle pairs left in the country, 50% of that is found on, found on Mindanao Island, where we're Philippine Eagle Foundation is based. No? As of now, the foundation is monitoring. We know of 39 occupied nesting sites across Mindanao, but the estimate is there, there could be uh, 200 pairs, uh, more or less. So what are the threats? No, It's basically shooting, you no know, hunting. We've tagged Philippine eagles in the wild. And based on our statistics, six out of 10 birds that we've tagged are actually shot and uh, killed. Mm -hmm. And then some of them are still trapped using uh, native snares. So think about that deforestation and then mortalities. You know? And we think it's, it's really high mortality rates due to shooting and hunting. Uh, and being slow in reproduction, it, it maintains a, a big territory, more than 7,000 7, hectares. So these are all, this biological requirement pushes the Philippine eagle to the brink of extinction. Why Why are they hunted? Sadly, some Filipinos still see a large bird as a food source. Okay, that's one. They're being hunted as a source of food. Second is these Philippine eagles occasionally feed on domestic animals. They prey on monkeys in the wild. That's why they're originally called, but then that was changed by uh, uh, President Ferdinand Marcos Ramos. in 1975. Oh. Marcos changed the name, did he? Yeah, it was Marcos who changed the name to from Monkey Eating Eagle to Philippine Eagle based on the information uh, that he got from uh, Dr. Bob Kennedy and his team, an American biologist who pioneered research on Philippine Eagles, to Philippine Eagle. 
And then it was Fidel Ramos who actually declared it as a national bird. So again, first is shooting and shooting. It's a source of food. Second, trapping and shooting because they're feeding on domestic animals. Still, farmers see them as pests of uh, domestic animals, mainly poor farmers who you can understand that they value their livestock more over Philippine eagles. And then, of course, there's still this hunting culture in the uplands, you know, where uh, the sight of a big bird it just makes them feel excited shooting down uh, a big trophy. I saw in some of the literature when I was researching, Jason, that birds were being shot and if they weren't killed or if they were being trapped, they were being sold. But they were being sold for as little as like 4,000, 5,000 pesos. That, that seems ridiculous because I'm sure if there still exists a black market for the birds, there must be... Hundreds of thousands, I would have thought, that crazy collectors would, would be paying. Now, I don't, I don't say that to encourage that, that mm, activity, right. but I say that to illustrate how little money it takes in a Western context to make a lot of money, a, a lot of difference to the people who could be protecting rather than hunting the eagles. Yeah, so, you're, you're perfectly right, yeah. So how do you enlist the local populations to assist in the conservation efforts? Yeah, that's a very valid uh, observation, oh, Grant. So just to give an example, during the pandemic, we had two cases of Philippine eagles that were trapped and uh, one was sold for 8,000 pesos. That's basically uh, very small no, compa- uh, if you that's, compare it with the U.S. rates. No? That's 200 Australian dollars approximately. Right, yeah, 200 Australian dollars. And then another bird, which we just rescued last March, was sold for uh, 5,000 pesos. And in both instances, it was actually concerned citizens, no? concerned citizens who spared the bird from getting cooked by the captor. So they paid this amount to get the bird and then voluntarily <laughs> over the bird to us for rehabilitation and release. And so we're, we're really very happy that there are concerned citizen, citizens who knows about their, this program and they were willing to shell in money uh, just to pair, spare the bird from a wasteful death. But I like your point. Uh, about a very small amount of money that motivates these people to spare it from getting getting shot. So, yeah, in terms of community-based work, again, unfortunately, we still have fellow Filipinos in the uplands who doesn't value the Philippine eagle as many of the lowlanders or people in the cities would value them. What we're trying to do with our community-based work is to make sure that once they decide you know, to embrace conservation, they get tangible benefits and they work with us, with us so that eventually they'll get to understand and embrace a conservation work. How are you in the foundation trying to shift those attitudes where the natural world and everything within it is valuable? I'm guessing that forestry is still a major source of income in these forested areas. How do you turn around that mindset where the timber has value as a log, but it doesn't have value as a standing living tree? Right. Yeah, it's basically partnerships, genuine uh, partnerships coupled with what we've been calling right mix of incentives as well as education and law enforcement. Let me also add that in our community conservation work, we practically focus on Philippine eagle nesting sites. And in the Philippines, although if you think about the forest, it's very remote, you might think that uh, these places are not inhabited. But actually, majority of our forests are actually peopled landscapes. You You have the indigenous peoples, you have the migrants, people who are trying to look for lands uh, that they can till. So most of them go in the in the uplands, and they're mainly poor uh, by mainstream standards. Okay, so nesting sites. Why? 
because Philippine eagles are very loyal to the places where they breed. Now, these are essentially ancient nesting sites. And any nest site that's close to communities, they're very vulnerable, especially when they're nesting. Whenever we hear reports, local reports of nesting Philippine eagles, and they're very close to communities, that's where we go and invest on establishing partnership. I've mentioned a culture-based conservation approach. So what is this? This is offering a partnership with the community, helping them with meeting their aspirations. We help them in planning what they want or what they aspire in the next five years as, as development for their community. And then we help them you know, achieve these aspirations. It could be economic, health aspirations, education aspirations, depending on what's on the plan. We find partners. We link them with partners, we provide capacity building, and by doing that, we slowly change the perception about the natural world. There are instances where communities, traditional practices that conserves biodiversity, so we reinforce that, we strengthen that. So again, it depends on the community, but a very important ingredient of our community-based conservation work is tangible benefits, including economic benefits. Let's pause there for a minute. We'll come right back to where you left off. But when did the foundation begin and what has been the, what's really been the history of it and what have been the really great successes that you can point to in the development of the foundation? Yeah. So who's the Philippine Eagle Foundation? We're uh, an NGO, a conservation, non-governmental organization, not profit. The organization started in 1987. So it took off from a a former national program for the conservation of eagles. The conservation program, as well as the research, started as early as the early 70s. But it was primarily a government program until uh, during the early 80s, resources have dwindled. And uh, the government wanted to close the Mindanao program. So that's where the first research and conservation program uh, began on on Mindanao. But then the the staff then of the government program asked help from businessmen and politicians in Davao City specifically. And they reorganized the project into a uh, non-profit project. And that's when the, the NGO started. So what are the key contributions of the organization for the past, I think we're turning 35 next year, no? so the past 34 years. First, of course, is the first successful breeding, conservation breeding of Philippine eagles in captivity. The first Philippine eagle was hatched in 1992. So that was a product of uh, long years of experimentation, of training. You know, we have our pioneer biologists who have, one of them who, uh, who has retired already, but he, uh, he also still acts as consultant. So he has to train with international organizations or zoos like the Peregrine Fund in uh, UK and then also in Canada organizations. And then when he came back, he implemented what he learned. And then that resulted to the first captive bred bird in 1992. So the bird was named Pagasa, and Pagasa is the Filipino word for hope. No? So that signaled essentially a hope for our national bird by through the contribution of conservation breeding. And uh, since that time, we've bred 27 more birds you know, in captivity, including Philippine eagles and, and other birds. No? And two of the birds, actually, we've loaned as part of a a species loan program to a facility in Singapore. Uh, This is the first species loan program for the Philippine Eagle. Partnership with the Singaporean government. The bird is now Jerome Bird Park in Singapore, and then they're trying to breed these birds as well. So that's one, conservation breeding. Second is uh, the first community-based conservation during the early 90s. So we've piloted, um, I believe, the first community-based efforts for conserving the wild population. And this eventually evolved into now what we call uh, culture-based conservation, where we think that our approaches and engagement of uh, indigenous peoples uh, across the Philippines is very pioneering. We now have 15 indigenous communities helping out Philippine eagle bears, preserving Philippine eagle. And a specific program, no, which is I'm very proud of, which we have learned, or shall we say, innovated from the 
caring for country program of Australia. It's Ranger program. You know, it's very popular in Northern Territory. We now also do our forest guard program with the indigenous uh, people. So trying to provide decent income through forest guarding, but then also delivering clear conservation results. So I think that's three main things that the foundation is basically known for. Conservation breeding, our pilot community-based work, and our culture-based conservation and the forest guard program. What are the tangible benefits that the communities get from being involved? You said you asked them to set their goals for a five-year period. What do they usually aspire to? And after being involved, what do they usually find that they get, for want of a, a better term, but what do they usually achieve from being involved? Yeah, so what are these uh, tangible uh, benefits? Um, you'll be surprised if you look at their all, I think all of the conservation plans would mention livelihood assistance. Okay, it depends on their skills. So this is very much dependent on the competencies and existing skills of the community. Second would be educational support. No, it's a basic need. Families would want their kids to go to school. So this involves us brokering for construction and setting up of daycare centers, primary schools, close to or within remote communities. And then there's also health concerns. No, We also go into that, you know, facilitate access to uh, basic health uh, needs, like setting up health centers, getting a partnership with the Department of Health. For, so these are the three uh, top, top aspirations. No? So for example, in one of our nesting sites, through a uh, partnership with corporate funders, we were able to set up a full elementary school in a very uh, remote community. And, and this was in early 2000. And the, the story of the community is that we don't want our kids to walk four hours no, to get to the nearest school. Okay. Okay, then. If we can help you set up a school here, would you help in protecting the Philippine eagle? So after that, the Philippine eagle pair breeds once every two years. We get to monitor the birds. We've organized forest guards. I think that's another tangible benefit. You know, they get uh, daily income from doing forest, forest patrols. Okay, we fare them fairly. And then also, I guess, the non-material incentives, such as uh, prestige and doing conservation work and the government and the general public admiring or, shall we say, you know, patting their shoulders for doing this. So again, a combination of material benefits, clear income. Now we have indigenous women that we've trained to hand to plushies, wildlife plushies, and then we sell them on their behalf as tokens. You know, and these are really sources of additional income. And, and through that, they've learned to, to embrace the Philippine eagle as their own. They always say that because of this support, we've now considered our resident, you know, our neighbor Philippine eagle family as like a, a, a member of a family to us. So these things, you know, attachments and embracing the, Philipp the Philippine Eagle as part of their community are, I believe, long-term outcomes of the conservation. Philippines is a big place. It's far-flung. These forest habitats are far from your major cities and towns. And in some places, indeed, I think getting to the centre and the west of Mindanao can be can be challenging. So I'm wondering now that you have these monitoring systems in place for established nests and the communities being involved, how are up-and-coming biologists, ecologists who are studying in the Philippines, are, are they wanting to continue their education, their research work, working in those forests, which are becoming harder and harder to find in the Philippines. Do you, are you well plugged in to the existing <coughs> academic framework now? Yeah, I have to admit that we still have a very few field biologists or field researchers. That's one of the, shall we say, challenges. So, Can I ask uh, you, Jason, 
Can I ask you, is that because there are not the students wanting to come and be involved or is it just that the logistics of doing it are really difficult? I think uh, it's also about the priorities of the, of the families of these biologists. You know? In terms of logistics, there are very few opportunities. I think I could start with that. Very opportunities for few opportunities and resources for supporting field biologists. Like, for example, the Philippine Eagle Foundation. We have a volunteer program. We have uh, internship programs. But we can only accommodate few, few biologists. But also on top of that, I think in the Philippines in general, conservation biology or a, the work of a field biologist is not seen as something that's really brings you a good life, so to speak. I'm also a professor in a local university. And I can say that maybe two thirds of my students, biology students, would go to medicine. And this is basically pushed by their parents as well. As you well know, in the Philippines, parents have a very big influence on the career decisions of their kids. No? But yeah, of course, safety also is a consideration. Not all of the forests of, the, of Mindanao specifically is uh, safe for biologists. Yeah, I think the field of conservation is still. Uh, relatively. And I could also add that the current situation of the pandemic is not also helping in terms of engaging more researchers in the field, because even us, no, that's one of our challenges now. It's quite, it takes a lot of resources to organize field expeditions. And then it's logistically, it's challenging to bring people uh, in the field. But yeah, I think uh, everyone knows this. The, the pandemic really has a, a large impact on conservation work as well as developing new talents to join the very, very few network of conservationists and field biologists in the Philippines. And well, no, here in Australia, that's not a uniquely Philippines problem. I think that working in the conservation, any of the allied sciences for conservation is a very difficult way to earn a living because it's not highly valued and there is not a high payoff. You can be the best conservation biologist in the country and you'll never get as rich as most people don't aspire to be rich in this field, do they? But you certainly are not going to be treated the same way as a medical researcher or a software technician just not seen to be that valuable and that is one of the challenges for all of us who are interested is to just keep raising the profile. I was wondering Jason once you have a foundation established and you have great partnerships I noticed that USAID have been uh, a partner long term with the foundation do the government see that as a way to not continue to be committed to providing support and resources, even if it's logistics or if it's army protection or whatever, if you need to go into some of those dangerous areas? We, there are some security concerns in some parts of the Philippines for non-locals. Does the government still want to be active or do they do they now say you've got the foundation you look after it the government of course has a, has a program for the conservation of the philippine eagle it's lodged in the department of environment and natural resources so they have a separate program and this is where they're investing their own resources no? of course we're very happy that the government provides you no know, i could say that during the pandemic our partnerships with the DNR across different regions allowed us to rescue Philippine eagles no, across Mindanao. In fact, we've rescued 10 Philippine eagles already just within the pandemic period. And that's one of the highest, that's the highest rescue rate ever in just one year. In the past, we rescued two Philippine eagles, you know, on the average two Philippine eagles per year, but now 10 Philippine eagles, which is really alarming. So we very much treasure the partnership we have with the national government, but finance-wise, no, we were not getting uh, much of that. But we're, we do get support from the local government units, and and I, I believe uh, it is the local government units, no, the, the municipalities, the provincial government, who are now stepping up in terms of protecting their natural resources within their territories, within their backyards. 
So we have wonderful partnerships with local government units. Just last uh, March, one municipality celebrated its uh, town festival in honor of a Philippine Eagle family within their uh, territory. And they call it the Banog Banog Festival. In the Philippines, we have lots of festivals. And this municipality, which is uh, Manolo Fortich in Bukidnon, is one of the very few municipalities who you know, solely dedicated a, a festivity in honor of their Philippine Eagle family. And then our Forest Guard program is supported by the local government unit. In Davao, we have almost 200 Forest Guards looking after four Philippine Eagle pairs, and they're paid uh, and then they're equipped by the city government of Davao. And we facilitate this project. Of course, more resources are needed, but this is very promising. And again, we're trying to step up our advocacies and partnerships so that more uh, local government units would help in and invest on using the Philippine Eagle as a flagship of forest conservation. I'll have to get the details uh, off you later, but I want to go to that festival. I want to go. That brings me to the thought about developing ecotourism as an income stream for these regions. Do you think that is a sort of short to medium term possibility or is that quite a long way off into the future? Assuming that we get past COVID in the next couple of years? Yeah, definitely ecotourism is a promising uh, venture for community-based, or shall we say, uh, biodiversity-friendly enterprises. Although we think that including the Philippine Eagle as part of the ecotourism experience, at least in the wild, is we don't recommend it. There are people who thinks that bringing in bird watchers or photographers to Philippine eagle nesting site and experiencing the birds while they're nesting could be, uh, it brings in uh, funds, but we think that it's very risky, especially since we're dealing with an IOC and critically endangered species. But agricultural tourism, experiencing forests, experiencing wildlife, I think it has great potentials, especially now where I think tourism is also moving towards outdoor activities because in a way that's uh, kind of safe no? as far as COVID is concerned as long as you're practicing proper social distancing so people can easily practice that in the outdoors in the in our region that's essentially the, the the tourism direction and but it takes I think a lot of a relatively some investment in terms of training communities as effective tour guides the provision of the services to your potential tourists in fact, we, we're also doing that. We've trained some community members on basic cookery and as effective tour guide, but it hasn't, the enterprise hasn't taken off yet. But it's really, it really has a great potential as so additional enterprise you know, and income source for, for communities. You mentioned that there's been some successful captive breeding. How adaptable are you finding the birds to life in captivity? What, and what are the real main challenges to setting up a successful breeding pair in captivity? Yeah. So, fertility of the birds. We think that through you know proper and sound animal husbandry techniques, you know, we can really maintain them in captivity. And we have cases of birds you know, that are that really lived uh, a full life in, in captivity. And as I've said, we've bred them successfully. Twenty eight uh, Philippine eagles bred in. I think the major challenge really is rearing or taking care or, or, or raising these chicks, and then getting them ready for a life in the wild. That's still a big question mark, or shall we say, uh, experiment going experiment on our part. We, we released three captive bred birds, and unfortunately, two of, them, two of them died. And then one, we had to capture it again and bring it back to captivity because it's basically used to people. It's used to people, so it won't survive in the wild. So I guess that's the big gap, reading the birds suitably and then before we release them back to the wild, because that's what's the, that's the intention of the conservation breeding program really is, not to breed birds and then release them in vacant habitats or in populations whose numbers are really very low. It's 
relatively, of course, uh, an expensive program. And recently, we also have the challenge of development, increasing build-ups around our conservation breeding facility. You know, we run the Philippine Eagle Center. It's the only conservation breeding facility in, in the whole world here in Davao City. But unfortunately, development is, uh, progress is uh, increasing around the center. We think that the facility is vulnerable to exotic diseases, such as avian flu and Newcastle's disease, the poultry disease. So we're now thinking of setting up a new facility that's relatively isolated. And we're looking at the numbers, it's quite expensive. But for the meantime, we still we think that the fight the wild population has a fighting chance. So that's why most of our funds are really intended to protect what's left of the wild population and also prevent more hunting and shooting. And a very promising initiative that we're looking at is what we call conservation translocation. And that is capturing these young birds in the wild, sparing them from mortalities, and then translocating them or transferring them to protected places that are vacant or whose uh, Philippine eagle populations have been. So that's another exciting aspect of our ongoing conservation. How many suitable places around the Philippines are there that might support a translocated pair? We think that the forest of uh, Leyte in the central Philippines are suitable habitats. We've been doing surveys there since 2013. And unfortunately, we haven't seen the birds yet. No? And we think it's either the population numbers there are very low or we have lost the Philippine eagles totally in this place. It's very interesting. No active nest has ever been discovered uh, on the island. And there are even no rescues of Philippine eagles, no? also from, from the same island. The last sighting of a juvenile Philippine eagle was... Oh no, Jason looks like he's hung up and gone. Hopefully he'll be back in a moment. Let me see if I can... Get him out and get him back. Oh. Jason, you're back. There we are. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. I, I know what it's what it's like. It's no better here uh, a lot of the time. Now, we were just talking about Leite, and you were saying there have been never been uh, found an active nest in Leite. I was wondering where in Luzon are they still hanging on? Well, in Luzon, you still have them at the, the northern Sierra Madre Mountains, or practically the whole Sierra Madre, Madre Mountains of uh, the eastern side of the island. So we still have eagles there. We've seen them before. And then, interestingly, in 2015, you know, we found the first Philippine eagle active nest in Apayao, that's in Cordillera. Northern Cordillera. So, you know, it, this is really very interesting because in the past they thought Philippine eagles doesn't exist in uh, the northern Cordillera side. So this is in in the middle part of northern Luzon, mainly within the provinces of Apayao and then also areas of Ilocos Sur. So after five years of searching for them, we finally found the first active nest. No, not only on Apayao but the first Philippine active nest on Luzon. Uh, they, we know that the eagles are there, we see them, but we never found any active nest. So we think no, you still have uh, a good number of Philippine eagles on uh, the Zon Island. But there are places where we think they've been lost already. So for example, in Mount Banahao in uh, Quezon Province, that's a big protected area. We think they're lost there. The Zambales Mountains, you know, and this is in the west side of the island, and then perhaps also in, in, in Bataan. So... These are actually potential release sites, no? as long as they're pretty much protected. And of course, the people are willing and interested to help with restoring a, a national icon within their territories. Perhaps that idea of, of ecotourism is more appropriate in Luzon than, uh, than trying to apply it to Mindanao in the short term. So that... Uh, I'm, I'm a, I'm a bit amazed that there are so many places in Luzon where where they either might still be or 
could be re-established if the if the stock could be found. And you mentioned Samad, didn't you, as being one of the islands where they still exist. How big do you think the population is is well, there? Summer Island is Summer Island still has a good lowland forest. Uh, I don't know the exact figures, but I think maybe still 70 maybe 50 to 70% of the island still has good tracts of lowland forest. And uh, we've seen nesting birds in Samar. We've seen one in the center part of the island. We've rescued several birds from there, and we've seen several pairs. We think that the population in Samar is pretty much in good shape. And we're thinking of, in, in terms of in the future, future conservation translocation, Samar could be a, a, a good source population. Young birds, more than two years old, leaving their parents' territory, wandering around. Uh, and that's several years. No? Before a Philippine eagle becomes sexually mature, male eagle should be around seven years old, while a female eagle should be five years old. So just imagine, no? two years old to seven years old, that's five years of floating around. And that's when they get shot or trapped. Majority of the eagles that we've rescued, we've rescued 89 Philippine eagles already since the program began. Nearly all of them are actually immature birds. So just imagine if we can spare this surplus, no floaters, as they are also called, no birds with no territories yet, mm. save them from getting shot or killed, and then translocating them to places that are safe. So that would improve the numbers, you know, reduce mortality rates and increase survival rates. Have you got plans for a structured pilot program for translocation? Yes, yes. We're actually doing that. The preparations, including social preparations in Leyte. I'm happy to share that the Australian government actually is supporting us on this, the Australian embassy. We're now on our second year of support, trying to establish protected areas within Leyte. Of course, we don't want to release the birds uh, in Leyte unless the place are you know, protected in paper, but also functionally protected. And then we have now host communities who have been working with. We have three uh, communities already in two possible big forests where we think we can release the birds. We've now established a forest guard program there where we're providing livelihoods and we're building a network of partnerships you know, from uh, corporate partners, LGUs, you know, two of the LGUs, these are uh, municipalities, are now in the process of creating ordinances that would declare the Philippine Eagle as their flagship. And these municipalities would be your host release site. So all of this, you know, slowly but surely, we're trying to build constituency awareness. And uh, once we get the permit from the national government, we'll start translocating birds to, to Leyte. Uh, mainly from Mindanao and then maybe in the future from Samar Island. Is the genetic diversity of all of the populations adequate? Yes, it's adequate. There's uh, still good genetic diversity. We have colleagues from a university in Luzon, University of the Philippines, Deliban. They did the genetic studies of Philippine eagles. Uh, all eagles from different islands are just one species, and there's still genetic diversity. And we can practically move around individuals without causing any genetic defects or deficiencies to the, to the, to the birds. So again, we have the genetic evidences that we can do conservation translocation. There's an impetus, especially now in Mindanao, what's happening with the birds, we're We've rescued, again, 10 birds. I just imagine if we can, future birds, we can spare them from getting trapped or shot and then move them to safe places. And then also we're building a constituency. This is, I think, the idea really is to bring back a predator to a forest ecosystem where the, the apex predator, the Philippine eagle, has been potentially lost. I, I, the local government likes the idea. It makes sense. And the Philippine eagle is a good flagship also for conserving forest in general. Yeah. All right. I have to ask, it's been bothering me since we first talked about the bird being hunted and being eaten. How can they taste better than a chicken? <laughs> I don't really know. <laughs> I don't really know. Do people think think they taste good? Is or do they or are they being eaten for I think part of it is is necessity but also even the hunters themselves they 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 uh, there was one interview I did practically cooked a Philippine eagle and 
he didn't like the meat. He said that it's tough. It doesn't taste good. So I think the hunting culture, in a way, drives them to shoot a large bird, but they don't really get a good benefit out of it. We can understand that for those who own sly piglets and then and even who are attached to their dogs, because eagles sometimes also take on dogs and cats, domestic cats, they have a, a motivation to do. But we're trying to turn that around. You mentioned something about black market. Fortunately, the Philippine eagle is not in the illegal wildlife trade business, which is Thankfully, it is not. Just imagine if the Philippine eagle feather is as valuable as an ivory. Now, the Philippine eagle would be extinct, I'm sure. And so it's basically hunting due to necessity or to in retaliation to other animals getting predated. And this behavior can be reversed. Now, we really believe that this can be an issue. We just need to invest on improving it. It boils down to poverty. Many of the hunters... Or those shooting the Philippine eagles are really hard. There are people stoling eaglets from the nest, expecting a few thousand pesos of reward. This is basically because of poverty. And 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 if we can address that uh, and turn that around, then there's still hope for the national bird and biodiversity in the city. Now, when you're involved in the conservation effort that involves preserving habitat, you are preserving all of the species that are in that habitat. So what are there other species that the foundation has started to turn its attention to or are you only focused on the eagle? Yeah, we're very much focused on the Philippine eagle, of course. As a flagship species, we think it's easy to fall in love with the Philippine eagle. It's a very charismatic bird. We're also using the Philippine eagle as an umbrella species. I should mention all biodiversity that's within uh, the territory of a protected protected park intended to preserve a pair of Philippine eagles, say 7,000 hectares of uh, Philippine eagle territory is protected, that also practically protects other species. So we're not really focusing on other species. It's basically just uh, the, the Philippine eagle. We're at the center. Of course, we rescue and rehabilitate other birds of prey. You were about to tell us about some of the other birds of prey species that you rescue. Tell us about the other significant birds of prey that exist in the Philippines? Yeah, we have the endangered, I see an endangered Pinsker's hawk eagle. So this is a species of diurnal raptor that's found only on Mindanao and the Visayas region. Okay, and then another endangered species is, of course, the Philippine hawk eagle in Luzon. Okay, they were formerly the same species. No? These two uh, new species belong to the same species. But then because of you know genetic data, uh, there was a split. So from a vulnerable status, they now became, each species now became endangered. So we're, we're also doing rescues and releases of these animals. So what we're doing essentially is whenever we go out to do community-based work, it's basically also a work for conserving other biodiversity, uh, using the Philippine eagle as flagship. You know, hornbills, we have three charismatic hornbills in on Mindanao. You have the Southern Rufus hornbill, you have the Rife hornbill, and Mindanao hornbill. And these are all IUCN threatened species. Okay, we also have several plant species or trees. You know, nesting trees of Philippine eagles are at the same time endangered. The Lawaan a group of trees, Masiga. So, we think that by sticking with uh, the Philippine eagle and using it as an umbrella, as a flagship, uh, as an indicator species, we're also uh, conserving uh, the rest of uh, Philippine biodiversity, at least the, the forest's uh, ecosystem. How many raptors are there in the Philippines, approximately? Yeah, I think we have more or less than 40, 36 to be exact, raptor species. Diurnal raptors, and that includes, of course, your falcons as well. We have the white-bellied sea eagle. We have, of course, the migratory gray-faced buzzard. We have several migratory species. We have the, some other, like the Philippine serpent eagle. That's a oh, yes. Yeah. Species yeah. As well. We have the Philippine well, small falcon. And whenever we go out you know, to do surveys, we, we also take note of, of this species. Rufus-bellied eagle. We have crested goshawk. What else? The, um, and, and others. Does the peregrine exist in the Philippines? 
yeah, we have two subspecies. One is a resident subspecies and the other is uh, migratory. Yeah, you can even see them in the cities. No? They're sitting on uh, high-rise towers, no? mobile towers. So it's becoming a, 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 good, a novelty to people in the urban areas, no? uh, especially since bird watching is becoming popular lately. Now that, that's good to know because I haven't been to the Philippines now since twenty late twenty sixteen, I think, early twenty seventeen, and I, I would say to people, I want to go bird watching. I want to go bird watching, and everybody thought that I was kooky. They're just like, what? <laughs> so, so I'd be really happy if it uh, catches on. Quite a bit. Same with camping. No one seemed to like the idea of going camping. I think trekking would be, mountaineering would be a more uh, popular term here in the Philippines. We have uh, a good number of uh, mountaineering groups across the country. There are also networks. Uh, we get volunteers from these networks. So yeah, trekking and mountaineering. And it's also becoming a popular shall we say, ecotourism initiative. There are indigenous peoples who are organized trekking, mountain trekking. We have one partner community whom we have assisted, and they were very successful at organizing this group of trekking or mountaineering. So I think that's a, a very popular outdoor activity in the Philippines. Now, I've only got a couple more eagle questions. One is, how big does an aviary need to be for you to house a pair that you might be breeding f from, <clears throat> to breed from? Yeah, for uh, a pair of Philippine eagles, I think the largest aviary would be as tall as a coconut tree. So maybe that's like um, more than 10 meters, maybe. I don't know the exact uh, dimensions, no, but we do have domes that are as high as a coconut tree, and it needs to be big, you know, spacious, maybe in terms of the width, it could be, shall we say, maybe uh, 10 meters in terms of width. Because uh, before you introduce a Philippine eagle pair, you need, you need to, or the individuals together, you need to put a, a barrier to, to put a barrier between them and make sure that they're really compatible yeah. because otherwise the very dominant and aggressive uh, female can potentially kill the smaller and more submissive uh, male. You know? So a female Philippine eagle could be between uh, six to seven kilos, while a smaller male could be four to five kilos. So we had cases before where a female eagle actually killed a male eagle when they were introduced outright in the cage. But we do have smaller cages for our printed birds. So when you say imprinted, these are birds who are uh, raised and trained to have humans as their surrogate partners. So they're in smaller cages, holding cages, where our animal keepers can work with them comfortably. So the uh, surrogate mate or animal keeper would go inside a male eagle's cage and then bring sprigs, you know, bring branches. This is during the breeding season. Put branches on the, on the platform. And then this male eagle would in turn fly around with that branch. It's as if offering a, a twig or a branch to, to the surrogate pair. And then that would entice it to eventually land on the shoulder of the animal keeper and then copulate. And then, of course, the surrogate partner would catch the semen uh, and then put it in a syringe. And that would be used for cooperative artificial insemination. The cage needs to be small so that they can work. You know, the animal keepers can work comfortably with, uh, with the animals. So we're, we're doing both a cooperative artificial insemination and natural pairing our facility in, in Davao City. With the artificial insemination, Jason, is it one, it, have you got the technique down so that it's quite a successful way of, of producing eggs? And are you are you able to take eggs from a pair that are imprinted and be able to put them into into a nest where they can be raised by eagles that are not imprinted? Yeah, for the cooperative uh, artificial insemination, I believe we're we're quite successful at it. We've uh, bred uh, birds uh, out of the twenty eight birds. There's uh, pagasa and then pagkaisa. 
they both uh, came from uh, the same female and then a few more birds. And then we're also successful at the natural pairing techniques you know, where a natural pair lays an egg, we take the, the egg and then artificially incubate it. You mentioned something about natural rearing. So that's basically after the, the egg hatches in the incubator. You know, we, we opt to artificially incubate the eggs to prevent accident loss of those, these eggs. But there's also a possibility that the chick or the once the egg hatches and, and we're sure that it's healthy, you can reintroduce it back to the parents so they would take care of it and that would, of course, avoid malimprinting. Now, we haven't done that yet. That's one of the things we want to do. Once we transfer to a different uh, facility, our biologist at the Philippine Eagle Center came up with uh, specific cage designs. You know, there's a specific cage for that. And that's one of the things we will be doing fundraising for next year with the establishment of uh, the satellite facility. And so, yeah, we think we're, we've mastered cooperative artificial insemination techniques. The only reason why we're not producing birds now is that the the... Our birds, many of our breeding birds are already old. So they're practically retirees and they're not as productive. Now we have a new batch of young eagles, but they're still very, we're still waiting for them to transition uh, start. Period. Yeah, transition period. So while in the transition period, we're planning to invest more on uh, establishing the, the facility, the right facility with the right equipment and tools. And that's hopefully at the foot of Mount Apo, which is a, a natural habitat and very safe for the Philippine eagles. It's also far from built-up areas and also community. Last question on the husbandry and whatnot of the eagles. When, when you remove an egg and incubate it in the incubator, do you give the birds a, a dummy egg, a replacement? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the guys at the... So that disclaimer, no, I'm not, I don't do that on a daily basis. No, I'm more of a field worker, but you know, our colleagues at the breeding facility, they do that. They replace it with a dummy egg yeah. and take it away again after a few days, because in the past we do double clutching that would allow the pair or the female to lay an egg again. So we had cases of successful double clutches. Oh, that's good. The knowledge is obviously being built up. Year after year, you build on on every little discovery and hopefully greater and greater success. Jason, if someone's listening and they want to support the work that the foundation does, what's the best way for them to support financially or in any other way? We would really appreciate, you know, if you can spread the word about the work that we're doing. If you want to know more about our operations, our activities, check our website. No, it's www.philippineaglefoundation.org. And if you also wish to donate you know, to, to help us fund the care of uh, Philippine eagles in captivity at the center, no, we have, uh, as of the moment, 36 Philippine eagles that we're taking care of. Some of them are breeding birds. And then we also have uh, over 100 more animals, you know, rescued wildlife, raptors, and also mammals such as deer and even crocodiles. No, we have rescued crocodiles also so any amount that you can uh, donate to us no, to sustain our work especially in this uh, pandemic unfortunately because of travel restrictions we've lost many of our visitors our visitor traffic has gone down substantially uh, from over 200,000 visitors every year pre-covid we, we only got 2,000 in 2020 to 2,000 visitors. So, so that really financially hurt us. So any amount that you can donate would be very much uh, appreciated. And also please like our fa Facebook page. We post on social media, our work with communities, our rescues and releases. Now we've rescued, uh, we've released four Philippine Eagles already during the pandemic period. And we're fundraising to release two more Philippine Eagles that we have successfully rehabilitated. So, again, if you can help us make this happen, this would mean a lot to the Philippine Eagles and also the places where they will be released to because we're starting efforts also to conserve these uh, patches of forest. Yeah. Now, you heard it from Jason there. You can spread the word by sharing the podcast and checking out the Facebook page, obviously, I'll have all the links in the uh, in the description and make it easy for you to check out more and more 
of the foundation's work. Jason, I nearly forgot you. I'll never hear the end of it from my friend Jesse if I don't ask you about, was it Pamiana? Tell me the story. Oh, yeah. So Philippine Eagle Pamana is a rescued bird from northern Mindanao. He was rescued as a very young eagle, uh, barely two years old. And we were successful at rehabilitating the bird. And then we released the bird in a protected area in 2015. So the name Pamana means uh, heritage or uh, a gift. But unfortunately, uh, after two months of monitoring of life in the wild, the bird was shot you know, uh, by a, a hunter living at the peripheries of a of this protected area, which is really very sad. We've done a lot of education campaigns, but I think that's the reality of having hunting, hunting within even protected areas. You know? Only a single person who has this his hunting culture in him, undoing uh, the many years of re- rehabilitation and education work that we did. But that's also an eye opener on how to work effectively with, with communities. We've learned a lot of lessons from that release. But again, we're trying our best to spare other eagles from having the same uh, experience. And so that's a sad story, but I can assure you that experience also resulted to some modifications and improvement in the way we do community-based conservation. Not all hope is lost with the passing of Pamana. You learn every time you learn something new. Now, Jason, I have to apologize for um, the listeners. I'm going to make a visual reference. Behind you, is that a Philippine cockatoo in that picture? No, it's actually a uh, white-bellied sea eagle. All I can see is the white. So I, I, I wondered whether you just had the, the iconic endangered birds of the Philippines in your house. Now we're going to move on to, the, to a bit of the fun stuff, Jason. Um, when you're out doing field work, what field guide do you use in the Philippines? Field guide. Oh, you mean the reference? Uh, yeah, so you can tell yeah. what what it is you're looking at. We've been using the, the classic Guide to the Birds of the Philippines by Dr. Bob Kennedy and his uh, co-authors. One of the co-authors of this book, Field Guide to the Birds of the Philippines, is our former uh, research director, one of my mentors, uh, Dr. Hector Miranda. So uh, he actually did the uh, painting uh, the plates for uh, raptors, including the Philippine eagle in that book. So I had a very special gift, Hector, uh, and I, I had the signatures of all the authors in that particular book. So there are new field guides who, uh, new field guides out there. They've changed names of the birds. The English names have changed, even scientific names have changed. But for sentimental reasons, I still use this uh, field guide. It's, it's a book, basically, uh, um, it's not handy to bring in the field. But again, for sentimental reasons, I bring it with. And then we also had uh, digital plates in my cell phone. So uh, that's also a handy reference whenever I, I go out in the field. Now, I believe there's a new app for the birds of the Philippines. Are you using that one yet? I haven't, I haven't used that yet. I should look into it. You know, I haven't uh, used that yet. But yeah, thanks for informing me. I should check that out. Indira recommends it. <laughs> oh, yeah. So maybe Indira is one of the developers. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. That's a reference to our friend Indira from the Philippines. Cockatoo Foundation, Katala Foundation. Now you spent time in Northern Australia. Where else have you worked apart from your patch of the Philippines? Basically, it's just the Philippines in terms of field work. I had uh, training in some places. Like I, I was very fortunate to do a almost two months internship in Panama with the Peregrine Fund. They have a very uh, impressive conservation program for the harpy eagle. That's where I, I, I had the chance to handle a, a female harpy eagle, which which is really huge. It's a uh, shall we say the heavyweight of your the raptors no and that's where we that's where i learned also telemetry techniques they were uh, monitoring harpy eagles uh, attaching satellite transmitters 
and and that that's where basically I, I got I got a skill, and then when I went back to the Philippines, and that was in 2008, I went back to the Philippines. I started also the same program, and we've now tagged, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 26 uh, Philippine eagles with trackers already. So. Uh, yeah, that was a very foundational experience, uh, getting to see the forest of Panama uh, and then also working with the wonderful guy. Very good fun there. There's so many questions I could ask you about the telemetry that you might have gathered, but maybe we'll leave that for a follow-up episode, yeah. which I'm sure will be required. But Jason, having been to Panama, having been to Australia, working in the Philippines, what's your favourite bird? Favorite word? I think it's obvious. No, basically it's the Philippine eagle. Like it's, I fell in love with the bird as a young boy, seeing its photo in, a, in an old National Geographic magazine. I think that's where it all started. But if you would ask me I, a, a second bird I love, then that would be, of course, the Philippine trogon. No, the Philippine trogon is a, uh, a very beautiful bird. They're uh, endemic to the Philippines. The males are more colorful than the females. And they have this melodious call. Uh, I just I just uh, enjoy looking at Philippine trogons. So I think that's the two top birds that I love. You asked me about Philippine birds. Is the trogon widely distributed or is it very difficult to, to see in the Philippines now? It's, it's still widely distributed. If you're in a decent forest, in a, an old growth forest, and even secondary forest, you can see it. It has this very melodious call that you can actually mimic you know, using playbacks. So in a way that can lure the birds. So I can say that they're um, pretty, pretty much easy to see in the forest if you're in the forest interiors. Now, of course, if you're in the right place. Uh, they're not yet IUCN wise, but yeah, they're really uh, very beautiful birds. I'll put that on, on my list. Now- Jason, where's your favorite? We'd be happy to bring you to places here All in right. Mindanao where we can see Don't them. worry. I'll be tapping you on the shoulder and, and asking for some localities. What's your favorite place that you have been bird watching? Favorite place? That would be Northern Cordillera in Apayao, Apayao province, where we saw uh, the first active nest of Philippine eagles in Luzon. It's one of the last. Uh, strongholds of lowland forest in the country. And what I really admire is they have this uh, traditional practice in, in that part of the of Luzon. They have, you have there the indigenous Isnag tribe, and they have this practice of protecting or setting aside forests whose owner has recently passed away. So they call it Lapat. And it's, we believe that it's this practice that kept the forest intact across generations. So if you, again, you've mentioned about ecotourism, this is a perfect place for bird watching. You can see magnificent birds just beside the road. They don't hunt the birds. Guns are banned you know, within the province. You don't see, there's very few people who's hunting this, these birds. And I, I believe that's the reason why the birds there are relatively not afraid of people. So you can see them up close. There was a, a plan by the provincial government to popularize bird watching prior to COVID. But again, unfortunately, COVID came, so that plan didn't uh, materialize. But it's so beautiful that we've been helping the province have it declared as a UNESCO biosphere reserve because we believe that it's one of the best examples of culture and biodiversity existing together. And I guess that's the reason why the Philippine eagles are also there. So, you know, Apaya would be a good place to go, uh, Grant, if, if ever <laughs> you, you can visit the Philippines. I'll be happy to bring you there. I'll be back as soon as I can, as soon as they <laughs> let us out. Um, Jason, have, have, you got, have you got a location that is on your bucket list? For, for bird watching or just for enjoying nature in general? Bucket list. In the Philippines, that would be Palawan. You know, I haven't explored the forest of Palawan. Of course, you don't have Philippine eagles in Palawan. That's why we never had the chance to do field work there. But I've been to conferences in Palawan, in Puerto Princesa. 
but I never really had the chance to go inside the forest and do bird watch. I've intended to visit Indira, who is a close friend. We were both recipients of the Witty Fund for Nature grant from UK, including another dear friend from the north who's working on Philippine crocodiles, the IUCN Philippine Endangered uh, Crocodile. He's also the operations uh, director of uh, Maboya Foundation. So we both want to go to, to visit Indira and also do bird watching in Palawan. So that's in my bucket list. Hope to do that soon. And after, anywhere after the pandemic. <laughs> and anywhere worldwide that you've got penciled in that you really would love to get to? That would be any place in the in South America and do and do bird watching as well. Now, I had a chance to see the birds of Panama. I would want to see birds in uh, South America, tropical jungles. So what's the bucket list bird? The bucket list bird. I haven't really thought about that. I still in that space of basically seeing as many birds as possible from different places. But perhaps top of the head would be the kakapo, perhaps. The kakapo? Uh, in, yeah, kakapo. Subject of the episode. last episode of the bird emergency. <laughs> That's good. I'll, I'll, I'll tune into that. Yeah. And is there, when you're out, out in in the field, is there a piece of equipment that you couldn't live without? A piece of equipment would be, of course, a binoculars, and that's Subsky binoculars. Okay. Yeah, that, and, I, have, I have and, this gear. So are they 8 by 8 by 50s or what? What it's you, basically 10 by 42. 10 by 42. Then I just did a, a bird watching this morning. We're celebrating, of course, it's International Biodiversity Day today. We're managing a woodland, and we and part of the celebration is a bird watching, public bird watching activity. So I was, you know, just showing off the Swarovski 10 by 42 binoculars that. I got as a gift from one of the master landsmen. So he visited the Philippine eagle nest on Mindanao. He was really very happy and he gave us six Swarovski binoculars and two field scopes. And it's still with us today. Very durable and high quality. Well done you. Well done, Swarovski. Good on you for supporting the, <laughs> supporting the foundation. That's nice getting a couple of field scopes. Very nice. Very good investment. Now, do you keep a list? Can you tell me your number? Oh, you mean the uh, birds? That I've yes, seen. yes, yes. Well, I have lost track of it. Sorry, Arjun. Oh, no. That, I that, have lost track of it. That's good. We, we say that the bird nerds, bird people, are on a spectrum. And at the extreme end of that spectrum are the people who can tell you the number and they can tell you how many in each family and they can tell you how many on each continent. So... Good. I'm not in that bracket. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Me either. A long way. When, like when you go out, you've been out today on a public event, but when you go out bird watching for yourself, do you keep a note uh, mentally of how many you've seen or do you just enjoy the experience? I could say that I'm more of the enjoy the experience type. I spend time with the birds and then admiring them. When I was still young, when I was still a young researcher, of course, I'm very much into listing the birds, both as part of the work and then also a personal pastime. But maybe if you're, I don't know, in my case, I just love enjoying the birds as I see them. And it's making these disconnections, shall we say, with these birds. When we went out this morning, I think we just because I was with a group of 15 tourists, shall we say. So we only had a very few numbers, just 20 birds, 15, 20 birds. But of course, you're with newbies. But but I was I did enjoy it. I did enjoy the, the bird watching initiative. So yeah, I think that's I'm more of the the moment uh, person enjoying the birds as they see them, as I see them. That's good to know. An immersive bird watcher, right myself. Oh yeah, that's the, the immersive. Memory in, immersive bird watcher. I like that very much. And maybe exactly. reflective bird watcher also. Actually, that leads me to a question that I don't usually ask, but have you noticed that the bird life generally in the Philippines is rapidly declining or 
do you think it's fairly fairly stable? Bird life in general, I believe, is still unstable in the sense that we're still losing forests. You would imagine that with perhaps increasing awareness and values for more protected areas, that more areas get functionally protected. But sadly, still, some sites are still being uh, deforested as we speak. Especially now, though, during the pandemic, we've seen more slash and burn farming because rural communities have to cope up with economic hardships. You know, they need to produce more food and sell their crops. But I think we've also seen resilience among some bird species. They're hanging out. They're hanging in there. You know, for example, in, in this uh, small patch of forest that we have, we did bird watching, we heard calls of the hooded, which is, it's, uh, it's not an endangered species, but it's a ground bird. And you would think that they're vulnerable to exotic ro- rodents or rats, no? But in this particular small forest, it appears to be still there, no? Uh, and then some parrots, and then guillabiero, and some endemic birds. So, as long as they're not shot or killed or trapped, we think that they can really adjust to some modified forest or even small patches. So that, in a way, is a ray of hope for these birds, but. Overall, in the Philippines, we still need to do more work in terms of protecting and restoring forest habitat, which is our ancient vegetation, by the way. We need to rebuild more forest in the Philippines, and uh, we need to do it soon. I can't resist this, Jason. How, how did you say the hooded, what was that, the hooded? Hooded pita. Now, you spent time in Darwin. You know how we would say that here. Hooded pita. I, do the, I, I never watched this because some of my Filipino friends, you know, they got the accent when they went back to the Philippines. I never had it. So, <laughs> of course, we, we've got the noisy pita, mate. The noisy pita. <laughs> Jason, it's, it's been a delight. I hope that, um, I hope that the travel restrictions and everything come down fairly soon and perhaps we could do a follow up episode sitting at the same. Uh, table and maybe without your family having to duck down and run backwards and forwards, tell them I'm very sorry for them. To, sorry. They, they 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 really didn't need to try and hide. And something I've noticed about your place because I, I I speak to people in the Philippines often. Where are the chickens? I haven't heard one rooster. In the subdivision, I think the. But we have a uh, fighting cocks. I was going to say, there's always a fighting cock. Someone's got a rooster in every. I've, I've ne- I never speak to anyone in the Philippines without hearing a rooster. So. I, I'm fortunate that I'm maybe like a hundred meters away from the closest <laughs> poultry. But yeah, well, but I have dogs and I have cats. Now sometimes the cats would pass in front of the computer. They're outside, so. <laughs> Don't worry, the listeners have met your dogs. It's been great. Thanks so much, Jason. I hope that you just go from strength to strength with the foundation and many more nest sites are discovered and and that you win the war. You win the war to save the Philippines Eagle. Thank you very much, Grant. This is really a pleasure. And, of course, thanks for featuring our work in your podcast. And congratulations and also... Cheers to more sessions. Thanks for doing the work. That's the, that's why I'm here is to feature the work that you and people like you are doing. And and I hope that your students, because you mentioned that you're, you're, you're teaching, you're a professor at the uni, I hope that heaps of people want to follow in your footsteps. Thanks for the kind words. Stay safe, Grant, and again, see you in flesh soon. <laughs> I hope so. That's been the Bird Emergency. Thanks so much for listening.